Hello, my name's Rufus Hound and welcome to My Teenage Diary, the show where each week we invite brave adults to look back at the pretentious, hormonal and often frankly embarrassing musings of their teenage selves as they read aloud their old diaries in public for the very first time. Will they be shocked to relive the traumas of their adolescence? Have they remained true to their youthful ideals? Will they experience the warm glow of nostalgia or the hot flush of embarrassment? My guest tonight is an actor, comedian and writer. That's what he's like now, but we're about to find out what he was like way back then. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Webb. <laughs> Hello to you, Robert Webb. Hello, thank you for having me. You, well, you're welcome. Mm. Uh, when did you start keeping a diary? I started uh, just after my 17th birthday. Uh, I was quite a late starter um, in more than one ways, as we're, <laughs> as we're about to find out. Um, but yes, this sort of goes from September 89 to September 90. It was quite a momentous year. OK. Um, what was it that inspired your diarism? Um, loneliness. Right. Um, mainly. I mean, I had friends, but, I, you know, there's that delightful combination of insecurity and conceit that I, <laughs> that I was sort of going around with that sort of made me think that this was really the best way to have a decent conversation, um, <laughs> just, to, just to really talk to myself. And... Right. Uh, what's going on in your life at the time you start this diary? I'm basically horizontal, uh, dreaming of horizontal girls. Um, <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm doing with... Most of my time. Uh, I live in a bungalow in a village called Coningsby in Lincolnshire with my mum and my stepdad, Derek, and uh, my baby sister, Anna Beth, who's only two. And my, I have two older brothers who've moved out. My mum and dad split up when I was about four, so I've been in this bungalow for a long time. Long time. Uh, you've actually got your diary with you this I evening. Have, yes. Would you describe it to the listener? Yes. Well, this is a sort of full scap sized paperback piece of stationery uh, nicked from the stationery cupboard of uh, Ross Poultry, which was a, a hatchery in uh, <laughs> where my brother worked. Um, <laughs> he decided to borrow this piece of stationery, and um, I decided to borrow it from him. So, a bungalow of thieves. <laughs> um, I, I can see as you flip open the front cover an inscription. Yes, on the, um, on the inside page, I've written The Secret Diary of Robert Webb, age 17, I suppose. <laughs> and then from the age 17, I suppose, uh, there's an arrow that goes to Or, The Secret Diary of a Tedious Jumped Up Little Burke. <laughs> and then underneath that, uh, there's a bit of dog roll. It goes, uh, Try to learn from history and you simply can't go wrong. But most things don't improve with age, they just carry on. <laughs> and then... And then a, another arrow from the Burke line to see what I mean. <laughs> so, already what we've got there is, is a young man who <laughs> confuses aggressive self-criticism with self-awareness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's 1989... The BBC have stopped making Doctor Who after 26 years. Iran has declared a fatwa on Salman Rushdie. And the M42 motorway is completed, giving the town of Bromsgrove a direct link with the M5. <laughs> but what's Robert Webb doing? September 1989. I suppose the desire is just to get everything down on paper and try to learn from it. I've often thought, one day I'm going to look back on my later teenage years as a rather difficult period of my life. Well, that's the hypothesis. Here comes the experiment. <laughs> whether this is a difficult time or whether life will always be this painful, I don't know. <laughs> to write it all down is a way of finding out. I'm a hopeless nostalgic, of course, and presume this will always be true of me. So, assuming this journal survives a few years, then it will probably be of massive sentimental value one day. I simply can't imagine myself older than 25. What will it be like? <laughs> and as two people over 25, I think the answer is fair to say rubbish, isn't it? Pretty, pretty rubbish. After everything Similar. After, yeah, everything after 25 is just a bit of a disappointment. Similar but slower. <laughs> yeah, and with less spontaneity. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's October 1989 and you've just turned 17. All week, Mum had been trying to get me excited about my birthday present, and as usual, she succeeded. In the end, it was an incredibly amazing electric typewriter. OK, driving lessons would have been more useful, but this shows that she recognises my interests, and that's worth more to me. An electric typewriter in 1989. Something of a technological cul-de-sac. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, literally still... within six months, everybody had computers. Yeah. <laughs> 
But I kept it for a while. It was ages uh, until I got a, a computer that you could do any kind of word processing on. And uh, I was still using it when me and David Mitchell wrote our first application to do a show at college. So there's a, a little, little thing that links David to mom there. The only thing. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> uh, this sort of recognition of your mum's, of you as somebody who had this literary bent, mm. was she a sort of solace in that way? Or were there other, lots of other characters around you who were encouraging you to sort of follow that? No, there weren't many books around that. I mean, no one had been to university and, you know, we read The Daily Mirror and we watched Blind Date and we drove small second-hand cars. And, but, I mean, the books that there were were hers and she liked a bit of Hardy and, and Lawrence. And, but the, the rest of it was um, Airport, so Jilly Cooper and, and all that. So she had a quite mixed taste, really. I think, I think her sort of literary, if you like, books were left over from school. But she noticed I was writing comedy sketches, uh, which I was already doing at, at school. So she, she bought me a typewriter. Yeah. Uh, well, let's carry on. But the event that really caused repercussions was my 17th birthday piss-up at the Beagle. The problem is that I get off with both Debbie and Sarah Kay. And here's where it all gets horribly interesting. The following days afterwards, the situation is this. Debbie has decided she fancies me. Though I like her, Debbie is unfortunately not the subject of my attention, or, let's face it, lust. That is most definitely Sarah's job, and over that weekend I most foolishly allowed myself to fall in love with the idea of going out with her. Well, although I never asked her myself, she got wind of my intentions and politely said sod off, and promptly went out with Mike Mason instead. I speak light of it now, but at the time it was flipping devastating, and I plunged heroically into a week-long depression session. Let's not mistake, I don't get pissed off for a week just because of one girl. No, what got to me was the regularity with which this seemed to be occurring. How many girls in the five years up till then had eventually said, let's just be friends? Sarah J, Maddie, Jill, Lara, Bridget, now Sarah Kay. As I said in a letter to Maddie, I should have known it would screw up. It always has screwed up. It always will screw up. <laughs> what didn't exactly help matters was that Maddie then went out with Andrew Plater. Andrew who? What a shock that was. <laughs> anyway, Andrew is of course mates with Mike, I'm a tosser and I steal women, Mason. <laughs> and so a cosy little foursome has now developed from which Bachelor Rob is now coldly excluded. It suddenly struck me I was alone, very alone. And that's where the rot set in. Everywhere I look, everyone has someone. I mean, I wouldn't mind if I was flipping boring, stupid and repulsively ugly, but I'm not. And it <laughs> beggars belief that people like Sarah see more in people like Mike Mason than in me. Frankly, what does he have that I don't? Experience and luck. That's what. <laughs> Is that it? Have I just been unlucky? I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't have a flipping clue. <laughs> I mean, you say you're very alone, but you are the object of Debbie's affections. Debbie, yeah. But, I mean, at the time... <laughs> you know, at the time, offering me a, a willing and available girl would be like, you know, giving a, a one-year-old a beautiful violin and expecting him to play it instead of using it as a hammer. Um, I just didn't know what to do with them, even when I got them. <laughs> yeah. Just so clueless. I mean, this is the story of... You know, this 17-year-old on a desperate quest to lose his cherry and uh, going about it in the most phenomenally inept way. Right. Also, uh, you are a teenager capable of writing. So, a cosy little foursome has now developed from which Bachelor Rob is now coldly excluded. Yeah. It's sort of like a waspy, homosexual, mid-50s... Yeah. <laughs> Drag queen. Yeah, I, I, I'm slightly worried that the audience is sitting at home diagnosing what the problem is. It's, <laughs> it's that you're gay. <laughs> um, you know, these girls, and this is my analysis at the time, I'm not sure if I've really changed my mind, um, they were just very dull. As far as I was concerned, they lacked that important spark of imagination that would make them want to get off with me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> these, were the, these were the daughters of farmers, policemen, Tory <laughs> councillors. I mean, what were they expected to do with me? I don't, yeah. think, I don't think this guy stands a chance. Yeah. They realised that there was a better pattern involved with a guy who could drive, mm. who was three or four years older than them, yep. and they were just too dim-witted to Uglier, look at, at you and realise... better at football, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, Friday the 17th of November, 1989. Sid's party, the most hype spectacle since Batman. I was talking to Billy and Aaron when Debbie kind of connected herself to me. Well, we sat down and, well, what could I do but get off with her? Now, people laugh at that. But I've been a 17-year-old boy and you are powerless to resist at that point. Somebody says, do you want to get off with me? Yes. Uh, I spent all of my time wanting to get off with people. Now the opportunity's arisen. It's happening. Yeah. Um, I couldn't have put it better myself. Yeah. That, that was exactly my thinking, yeah. uh, if I can call it thinking. <laughs> it was only briefly, and I suddenly realised that I didn't want this situation at all. There was a party going on, and I didn't want to be sat there, annoyed, with someone I don't find remotely attractive. <laughs> Anyway, after just one fairly long kiss, I heard You Got the Look come on, and I said, Oh, I've just got to go and dance to this. She relented. Re- <laughs> she relented reluctantly, and we went to dance. Well, already on the floor was Sarah Kay, who I fancy like a sex maniac. <laughs> And then I did something rather despicable. I started dancing exclusively at Sarah, totally ignoring Debbie. As well as holding all my sexual attention, Sarah is also a cool mover, and we really started freaking. After... Oh, boy. After three... After three or four songs, it became clear to Debbie that she might want to go and do something else. I felt quite guilty, of course, but I didn't really dwell on it. Dancing with Sarah like that was the most fun I'd ever had. It was really varied and sexy and just fun to do. After a while, we went outside to cool off. We didn't get off with each other, brackets, obviously more her preference than mine, close brackets. (laughs) But really, that's not what I expected, and I wasn't really disappointed at all. We split up when we got back inside, and I was just going back to talk to everyone when flipping Debbie sidles up, shoves a Bacardi and Coke in my face and says, I bought you this. Oh, get lost! (laughs) I mean, hadn't she got the message by now? Okay, getting off with her had been a bloody huge mistake. It was leading her on, and I suppose she had the right to think me a bit of a turd. But bloody hell, she went right over the top. She tried to put her arms around me, but I just disentangled myself and haven't looked her in the eye all week. (laughs) I was seriously wondering how I ever could have contemplated going out with her, but the simple answer is this. Desperation. Seventeen and a virgin. Of course... It's not just the sex, but that is the most clear demonstration of my lack of success in relationships. (laughs) It is the sex! (laughs) Yeah, it definitely is. You don't come out of this episode particularly well, do you? No. Um, I was keen to include something that was unsympathetic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just for fairness. This is terrible (laughs) behaviour. If Debbie's listening now, do you have anything? Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's, it's, e- it's an easier sorry to say when you're a grown-up, isn't it? It is. I still don't want to see her, though. <laughs> I'd, still be a bit, I'd still be a bit scared. I'm just imagining a, <laughs> a woman much older with a flat Bacardi and Coke <laughs> <laughs> mournfully out of a window. <laughs> Friday the 24th of November. There's a girl at Gateway called Jo who I really fancy. She's quite small, with long, dark, wavy hair and a lovely smile. Trouble is, she only works on a Saturday, and she's always on checkout, so I never get to talk to her. Tomorrow night, loads of the lower six are going to the Beagle, and I've decided to ask her to come. Saturday, the 25th of November. She wasn't at work! Ah! (laughs) So, Sarah Kay is now out of the picture. Forget her, forget her. Debbie's well and truly dumped. Oh. It's now Joe from Gateway. Joe from Gateway. Did you work at Gateway? I worked at Gateway Supermarket um, for many years uh, after school and in the holidays. And uh, if I could fancy Joe at Gateway in her in her Gateway uniform, then that says something about Joe. Um, so, did she work in any particular? Use? Was she a checkout? It, it was mainly checkout. Yes. It wasn't like the like, evidence is there. It was the checkout. Yeah, she wasn't like a fish counter. She or... wasn't fish counter. I was mainly uh, fruit juices and UHT. Um, but later on in my gateway career, I, I moved up to the meat. Um, I was uh, putting the putting the meat on the on the meat counter, sweeping up the uh, the blood left by left, left by the meat, um, polishing the meat window. Um, is that one, one this, pound, one is that, is that a euphemism? <laughs> Sunday the 10th of December. The inevitable disaster. Isabel told me Joe was going out with someone and was really head over heels in love with him. 
It really was a kick in the balls. <laughs> You'd think I'd be used to it by now, but no. That week would have been bad enough anyway. Maddie told me that Katie Marsden had said behind my back something I had suspected for years, that I'm basically too funny. Too funny. <laughs> too funny to be taken seriously by girls. I like his face and that, but he's always joking. He's just a joke. Yes, well, you, Katie Marsden, are a scruffy, nana cherry hating racist. <laughs> So you can shove that up the angry little cock you probably got hiding under your stupid ball gowns. <laughs> Is that funny enough for you, Katie? Are we chuckling yet? Your lump and bad perm thought 1984 was written by Roger Kipling, loser. <laughs> I mean, this is properly funny, this diary entry. S some work has gone into that, Yeah. Uh, by the look of it. And uh, vicious. Oh, yeah. So well, vicious. There's no need to be polite. I'm not going to go up to Katie Marsden and read this out to her. No. I wrote it, I posted it to her. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is but I mean, but that was a very, that was a very tender spot. <laughs> I'm, too, I'm, I'm simply too funny. <laughs> Imagine communicating not through jokes. I know. It would be, it'd be like living in France or something. <laughs> it's okay. Like a change of tone. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll uh, we'll turn a corner now. Uh, we're we're three months later uh, in March 1990. Friday the second of March 1990. My concern for Mum deepens. I'm ashamed to realise that this is the first reference in this diary to worrying about anyone but myself. I suppose this book was meant to be about me, but it's pathetic all the same. Mum has been in hospital since last Friday with what was supposed to be a chest infection. In fact, she has a few cancerous cells on her lung. She might have to have chemotherapy. Jesus Christ, I'm so worried. I love her so much. I must resolve to be less selfish, to talk to her about things more often. Life without her is unthinkable, literally unthinkable. Was this illness completely out of the blue? It was pretty... It was news to me at, at the time. I don't know how long she'd uh, kept it to herself, but she, I think, piecing it together afterwards, I think she had to wait a very long time to see a GP and then a long time to see a specialist and then an even longer for treatment. I mean, this is the end of the 80s, um, waiting times and waiting lists uh, on the NHS. They hadn't even bothered sort of counting them yet. So, um, suddenly the 11th of March. Everything has suddenly become so pressurised. I talked to Nobber, the headmaster... I talked to Nobber last week and he says I don't stand a chance of Cambridge without three A's. I want to go for it, but it's just going to be non-stop work for a year and a half and I don't know if I'm up to it or even just clever enough. Mum is home, no change. I failed my National Youth Theatre audition. Everything is set to go very wrong. Tuesday, 3rd of April. Found out for sure the week before last that Mum is definitely not going to recover. They say she has about four months. I don't want to talk about it, even to you. Tuesday 17th. Mum's condition gets worse. I feel helpless to do anything. She's dying. I'm not ready for this. Tuesday 24th. Dr. Campbell says 48 hours at the most. Mark, Andrew and I were in the front room. He addressed his remarks to the older boys like I was a kid in a nappy in the corner. Christ, I want this to be over. Is that bad of me? Later, Tuesday 24th. Mum dies at 2.45pm. I love you. Sometimes it snows in April. So... From your first awareness of it, six weeks later, what you've described as unimaginable has happened. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, the, the, the worst part by far was the, you know, the bit where I'm talking about uh, understanding for the first time she's not going to recover. There's, there's nothing in that. There's no consolation. There's only dread and fear. And, and what comes later, grief, is easier. Do you think it's... it's worse to experience death as a teenager rather than later in life? Yeah, it felt very tender. Uh, but I mean, what was sort of tragic from my point of view is we were just on the brink of a grown-up relationship and we were talking about stuff that we hadn't talked about before and we were sort of talking about books and I was just starting to make her laugh and she was the easiest person in my life that, that I could talk to and she was my favourite person. Uh, so that was sad. But then, there again, I was in a good place in other ways um, because I had this other thing to do. I had these A-levels to do. and uh, So I, I sort of had a distraction. I had a mission. 1st of May. Well, in the words of many relatives and friends, life goes on, doesn't it? Well, yes, for some of us it does. I shouldn't knock it. What the hell do I expect them to say? The funeral was a real highlight. I don't have a suit, so I unpicked the badge from my conveniently black six-form blazer. So a couple of hours later, I'd at least taught myself to sew. 
How's that for silver linings? Mark drove with me next to him behind the hearse. He was obviously a bit tense, keeping it between second and third gear, with the clutch on his Astra squeaking with every change. He said, how about a bit of music, and turned on the radio. It was Kylie Minogue singing, I should be so lucky. (laughs) We endured about 15 seconds of this before he said, yeah, maybe not appropriate. And then, rather wonderfully, he didn't just turn the radio off. He gently turned the volume down to silence, fading Kylie's warbling out as if in respect for the occasion. It occurred to me that this was the single most hilarious thing I'd ever seen or heard. (laughs) But we all just stared unsmilingly ahead, and I tucked it away for later. What's that Graham Greene says about every writer having a splinter of ice in his heart? I've got a splinter or two in mine now. Mark fading Kylie out. I've never loved him more. Faces are even grimmer than I expected, especially when they see me. But they're all old, and they don't have what I have. I've got a school badge in my pocket. It's funny. (laughs) You wrote a funny thing. What strikes me about it is there is a leap in literary ambition suddenly. I mean, that is a job of work. I mean, I don't need to be a Ponzi English graduate to go, there's evidence here. I mean, I remember. I remember taking a couple of other bits of paper and, and, and working on that. That's a set piece. That's half a morning's work. I write, I've got a school badge in my pocket, and I've already set up school badge as a sign of self-sufficiency. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I'm just sitting here giving myself a glowing review, but I've got a, I've, I've got a sense tonight I'm going to get away with it. <laughs> Sunday, 6th of May. Read D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers from start to finish yesterday. That didn't help. <laughs> Some good news. Well, Isabel and me had been getting on really well recently. She finished with Harry Edmund. I'd been flirting a bit, but to my delight, she seemed to be doing the same. Quite blatantly, in fact. My only doubt was that she'd heard about Mum and was just being nice. Well, today we were talking all lunchtime, and, well, we seemed to be going out with each other. I like and fancy her loads. How many times have I written, this is it, or could she be the one, or some other such crap? I don't know, but something is different this time. Something is different. Wednesday, 9th of May. Saw Isabel on Sunday. We met at 2 o'clock, went for a walk. Nice chat, no tension. Then went to hers, where her parents were doing a barbie. So then, well, yes, we went upstairs. I'm not sure if I should include everything in this diary, just in case one day I'm ever dumb enough to show it to someone. (laughs) But yes, we massively got off with each other. Then we came back here. By that time, it was dark, and the moon was shining really beautifully through my bedroom window. Maybe even my body looked okay in that light. Hers flipping well did. (laughs) It was amazing. I am amazed. Condoms are quite crap, though, aren't they? (laughs) As descriptions of first times go, that is actually rather romantic and poetic. It seems like a very happy memory for you. It was happy. I thought it would feel like a massive relief, and it bloody was. (laughs) (laughs) This relationship with Isabel is important in in light of... Yes, massively. I mean, she she came along just in time, really. I I could do with a bit of good news at that point, and it was was great. And she was really nice, and we were together for about a year, Um, off and on. You know, she, she debbied me, I debbied her. Um, there was a bit of debbying going on, but, um, but, but basically we were good mates and uh, it was a good thing. Yeah. Saturday, 29th September. Happy 18th birthday, Mr. Robert Webb. No, of course I don't feel any different. I can't believe the world now considers me an adult. It probably doesn't if it's got any sense. My party at the community last Friday was flipping ace. Everyone came, I mean, just the whole country practically. It was a real stomper. Everyone was pissed and friendly. Welcome to the big bad world. I picked my Cambridge college, Robinson. King's was just too cool and up itself. Robinson seemed to favour state school kids, although they're not allowed to say so. I think that's the smart move. They want AAB, so I'd better flipping well pull my socks up. I've been letting things get me down too often and should just try to cultivate a sense of inevitable good news. I should just start thinking and walking around like I know that Robinson will let me in and I know all the rest to come. Making a big splash in Footlights, finding some funny people to work with, Edinburgh Festival, Radio 4, Channel 4, BBC 2, plays, novels, Hollywood. I mean, it's all ludicrous, but why not? Ambition is free. This is no time to put limits on it. I'm going to be bigger than John Cleese. No doubt about it. (laughs) But, but isn't, isn't that incredible? You think how many kids have either thought that or written it in their own diaries. Yeah. And yet you sit here now as somebody for whom that genuinely came about. I well, mean, I, that's, think, I think that was, uh, it was a good attitude at the time, but just to 
unpick this slightly. From from this end, um, it, it might be worth striking a, just one note of humility. I mean, just fi- I mean, just once. Um, and saying so there was nothing inevitable about any of this happening. There were loads of strokes of luck, um, you know. And if I got if I got the A level results I wanted the first time. Uh, or didn't so screw it up that I that I had to reapply and go the next year. I could have ended up not at Cambridge or at Cambridge the year before. Either way, I don't meet David Mitchell. Either way, there's no Mitchell and Webb ready for when Sam Bain and Jesse Armstrong come up with a pilot for Peep Show. Peep Show is uh, Mark and Jeremy is played by the Chuckle Brothers. This is a, <laughs> a terrifying parallel universe to me, to, me, to you, to me. Um, and, oh, God, that was so good. <laughs> what was that you were saying about spontaneity? Well, uh, we've we've reached the uh, the the end of the of the diary, uh, and and it's a momentous year clearly. Now that we've read your diaries, what do you think you would say to the younger you? Uh, carry on doing what you're doing. Um, don't worry too much. It's all going to be fine. Yeah, and also cheer up. Those girls are never going to go out with you. Um, read some books instead until you go to, <laughs> until you go to college. <laughs> And what do you think the younger you would say back? Ooh, get over yourself, Baldy. <laughs> um, we always ask our guests to choose a song which sums up their teenage years to play us out with. What have you chosen? I've chosen Need You Tonight by In Excess. Um, <laughs> because I, I, certainly, I certainly did need you tonight. And you were never there. <laughs> oh, girls. <laughs> Apart from Debbie. It's not, it's not called Need You Tonight Debbie, is it? <laughs> no, but that is a Paul Daniels cover waiting to be recorded. <laughs> well then, we play out with Need You Tonight by In Excess, but we thank Robert Webb. <laughs> My Teenage Diary is a talkback production for BBC Radio 4. It was presented by me, Rufus Hound, and starred guest Robert Webb. The producer was Harriet Jane. And Robert Webb returns to BBC Radio 4 in a new series of That Mitchell and Webb Sound, our 6.30 comedy, on Tuesday evening. And now on BBC Radio 4, the first in a series of three stories specially commissioned to pay tribute to Belfast-born novelist C.S. Lewis, who died 50 years ago this month. A powerful story of identity and self-discovery begins now with The Bell Dress by Lucy Caldwell. It starts with the bell dress. Your mum takes you all to the store in Donegal Place the week it opens, braving the lashing rain in the queue outside, all of you jumping and shivering with cold and excitement. Inside is the most magical place you've ever seen. Your sisters go hopping and squealing to the cuddly toys at the back, heaped right to the ceiling. But you just stand, clutching your mum's hand, unable to move or even to breathe. It's like being in heaven or outer space or somewhere far